Well, good morning. So today is the uh, fourth and final week of our series called Haunted. And if you joined us for any of the weeks or if you watched online, uh, you know that in week one, we talked about being haunted by regret. And in week two, it was haunted by our hurts. And, And last week, we talked about being haunted by fear. Now today, we are, we're actually going to be talking about being haunted by doubt. Being haunted by doubt. I mean, if you think about it, doubt is tied to each one of those things we've already talked about. Our regrets lead us to doubt. I mean, we have, we have things in our past that cause us embarrassment. We have guilt. We have shame. And we start to doubt whether God can forgive us for those things. We doubt that God loves us as much as he loves other people because we have a past and they don't. Because of what we've done, we wonder, we doubt whether we can have a future because of our past. Our our hurts can lead us to doubt. Uh, We have experienced great hurt and so we begin to doubt whether we can even be healed. We doubt whether God can make us whole or whether we will always be damaged goods. Perhaps we've been betrayed by someone we love and we begin to doubt whether we are worthy of love and that action was so wrong, the situation was so terrible that it causes us to doubt whether there will ever be justice. In the same way our fears can lead us to doubt, we doubt whether God is with us because we feel so alone. We don't see him working, and so we fear, and we question whether he's working at all. We doubt that God can protect us, because our fears tell us that danger is so great and is so imminent. Our fears cause us to doubt that God really cares for us, really loves us, or that he will really be there when we need him. See, where we, where we said last week that our fear causes us to question the character and nature of God, doubt is that question. And so many of us, we doubt all the time. Just as we can be paralyzed by regret, paralyzed by hurt, paralyzed by fear, we can be paralyzed by our doubt. Something happens. We encounter an obstacle. We face a challenge. And so we just stop. Our doubt stops us in our tracks. And we wonder how the whole thing's going to play out. What's going to happen? We doubt if we can, if he can, if anyone can. And so we don't. We just don't. See, friends, doubts are obstacles. They are barriers in our way, but they are not insurmountable. They're not insurmountable. Today we're going to talk about how we can handle our doubts. And so if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. Mark's in the the second book of the New Testament there, right after Matthew. But today we're going to go to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. And we're going to to begin in uh, Mark 9, 14. We'll read to uh, verse 29 here. Hear the word of the Lord. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes disputing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing with them about? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. 
He replied to them, You unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening to him? Jesus asked his father. From childhood, he said. And many times it has thrown him into fire or water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out, shrieking and throwing him into terrible convulsions. The boy became like a corpse, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him, and he stood up. After he had gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he told them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. Thanks be to God for his word. Jesus and his inner circle, the the three disciples that he was always with, Peter, James, and John, they have just come down from the mountaintop. The transfiguration had just taken place. And man, was it an experience. And so they come down the mountain high on God, high on life, and they're met with a dispute. See, it was peaceful up on the mountain. There were no issues, no problems. And now they come down the mountain and it's chaos. There's a man, a father, He's scared. He's frightened for his little boy. He has experienced disappointment. Disappointment that his experience with his son isn't like everybody else's. It's not supposed to be like this. He's disappointed that nobody can seem to help him. He needs help. But he has doubts. The disciples, they've done things like this before, but even they couldn't help. See, maybe you're like this man. You're at the end of your rope. You've tried everything to no avail. You've heard that God can work miracles. And you've seen the difference that he's made in the lives of others. You believe that he can do it, but you doubt. Let me share with you three truths from this passage that we can see here. And if you struggle with doubt, or if you know someone who does, write these down. Write these down. Put them somewhere where you can look at them regularly. Put, them, uh, put these truths on repeat, if you will. But the first truth is that that your doubt, your doubt doesn't make you any less loved. Doubt doesn't make you any less loved. I mean, we tend to project, we tend to project uh, what we have experienced with others onto God. They left me. God will leave me too. They don't care. God doesn't care either. They don't love me. God doesn't love me either. Maybe I'm just not worthy of love. Notice here how gentle Jesus is with the Father. 
Sure, he rebukes the unbelieving generation, but the father comes with his child and he doesn't send him away. He doesn't chastise him for doubting. He asks for the child to be brought to him. He doesn't lecture him for what he could have done, should have done, didn't do. He sees right through this man's doubt and addresses his very need, what this man's deepest need is. This boy needs healing, but the man, he needs faith. And Jesus wants to meet that need. And the same thing with you and me. Jesus, he sees right through your doubt. He sees right through my doubt. And he says, you, your doubt doesn't change how I feel about you. I have a desire. I have a desire to heal you. Do you want to be healed? He says, I love you. I love you. If you have a desire to be loved, then look no further. Do you want to be loved? See, he is faithful. The Apostle Paul tells his young disciple Timothy, he says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He's not going to change. That's who he is. He loves because he is love. He doesn't stop loving because I suddenly feel unlovable. Trust me, if that were a prerequisite, if that were the case, I mean, I would have never been loved in the first place. We would have never been loved in the first place if we just feel worthy of love. No, like, we can doubt all day long and he will still love us all day long. I mean, in the same way, we, we tend to project these things onto God and just like we, we say, man, everybody else is like that and God is like that too. And so we think, man, he, they couldn't do it, so he can't do it either. There's no help for me. But the second thing we need to see, the second truth we need to see today is is this, that doubt doesn't make Jesus any less capable. Doubt doesn't make him any less capable. I mean, the boy's father, look what he says. The boy's father says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus responds with, if you can. (laughs) If you can. Everything is possible for the one who believes. I mean, if you can, that's laughable. That's laughable. I mean, they, there are things that you and I trust in every day. Things that we trust in every day that are far less capable than Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I mean, who knows how many things that this man has believed in to get him to this point where he is standing in front of Jesus and he's like, man, if you can do it, I don't know, if, whatever. But that aside, his doubts don't make Jesus any less capable. Just because you and I think something doesn't make it true. We think things all the time. Never once have we thought something into existence. That's what God does. God does that. God thinks things into existence. That's not us. Right? We can't think things into existence. We don't say who he is. He tells us who we are. And so, when you, in the same way, when you go out to your car in the morning, right, whether or not you think your car will start actually has no effect on whether your car will start. Okay? In the same way, you can drive around in a brand new car, drive around town, man, feeling confident, Feeling confident, the new car, this car is the best, it is the most efficient, it is the first in its class, right? No, I, uh, but, but, you know, it's the safest vehicle with four wheels on it. And I assure you, your confidence has no bearing whatsoever on the car's ability to work. It is outside of you, or better yet, you are outside of it. And in the same way, our feelings, they don't affect God's ability to be God. 
He can not only do all things, he can do all things perfectly. And when we doubt, we, we don't somehow change his nature. It's not like he suddenly becomes less of God, right? We can't render him to be unloving. We can't render him to be any less powerful. My doubt doesn't make him any less capable. I mean, it does, however... It does, however, affect my pleasure, my enjoyment in this life. If I'm driving around all the time scared that my car is just going to fall apart, the wheels are going to come off the thing, I mean, that's going to affect my ride. But see, that doesn't work the same way with God. God wants to show himself to you. That's why he sent his son, Jesus, to reveal him. He wants to prove to you that he is capable. He wants to prove to you that he is who he says he is. He doesn't have to prove anything, but he wants to. He wants to show you. And he wants you and me to know. He wants the whole world to know that he is holy and he is mighty and he is all-loving and he is all-powerful. So our doubt, it doesn't make him any less capable here. The third truth I want us to see today is that doubt doesn't make you an unbeliever. Doubt doesn't make you an unbeliever. I think so many times we convince ourselves, man, if I have my doubts, if I question God, then somehow that means I'm on the naughty list. (laughs) That somehow I, 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 I am, I'm somehow an unbeliever. No, Jesus says to the man, he says, if you can, everyone who, uh, everything is possible who, for the one who believes. And the man responds, I do believe. Help my unbelief. See, the boy's father is desperate. He is desperate. And he just sort of blurts it out. It's, it's perhaps one of the most honest responses in all of Scripture. The man is conflicted. He believes that Jesus can do it. That's why he's seeking Jesus in the first place. That's why he shows up at Jesus' feet, right? He, 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 he thinks Jesus can do it, but he's never seen it before. He hopes that it's possible. He doesn't know even if it is. But see, both faith and doubt reside in the Father's heart here. I mean, he calls it unbelief. He's really talking about doubt. He He says, I have faith. I believe. Help my unbelief. I mean, friends, doubt is a part of being human. Okay? A doubtless Christian is as impossible as a sinless Christian. Doubt alone doesn't negate what God has already done in your life and in mine. Doubt isn't the unforgivable sin. Sure, while doubt seeks to uproot the seed that has been planted in faith, I mean, the mere presence of doubt doesn't make it so. Its presence should give us a moment of pause uh, where it should signal to us to proceed with caution. The man had a little faith. Little faith. But thankfully, that's all you need. Jesus says that faith as small as a mustard seed, that's all it takes. A little bit. Move a mountain. I mean, I'm not going to stand up here today and tell you, doubt is good. (laughs) But it is far more important how we respond to doubt than it is the presence of doubt. So how we respond to doubt makes all the difference. So how do we respond? What do we do about our doubt? Well, the first thing is we need to go to God. We need to go to God. Recognize what is happening here. Satan doesn't want you to believe in God. Satan, he's kind of the anti-belief God thing, right? He doesn't want you to go believing in God. He doesn't want your faith to grow in him. He wants to try and cut down your faith in any way he can. And so he's going to try everything in his power 
to get you to doubt. When that happens, go to God. Run like that child running to mom or dad to uh, tell them about the bully on the playground. We need to run to our Father in heaven. Satan is a bully. Can't you, I mean, can't you just hear it, right? He said, my dad isn't very strong. Satan's trying to get me to believe. Everybody loves when the hero shows up on the playground. He's going to set the record straight. He's going to make things right. Uh, When he confronts the bully... And that's what happens in this very encounter here. That's what happens, right? He says, bring the boy to me. And right, and he says, the spirit saw him and immediately throws the boy on the ground, right? The spirit sees Jesus, throws him on the ground, right? And, and right there, I mean, the boy on the ground, foaming at the mouth, convulsing. And Jesus says to the unclean spirit, he says, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Don't come back here, you hear? See, the hero of my story, the hero of your story, it's not us. It's God. Go to him and own it. Own it. Own your questions. Own your doubts, right? Own those insecurities that you don't want to admit to anybody. Admit them to him. Go to him. Take them to Christ and unload them. I mean, flip over to Matthew chapter 11 for just a second. Flip right over there, okay? Matthew 11. Matthew 11. There is a perfect case study here, okay? A perfect case study for what to do with your doubts, and it's involving John the Baptist, right? All right, so Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. It says, when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Verse 2, now when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent a message through his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? When John heard what Christ was doing, now I don't know what he exactly heard, but whatever it was, it did not match up with what John was thinking in his head. And so John needs a little clarification, okay? See, John the Baptist was this prophet who was proclaiming that the Messiah was here. He was the herald, right? He was the guy putting the red carpet down, preparing the way for Christ, and letting people know that he has finally arrived. And after baptizing people in the wilderness and preaching repentance and talking a lot about Jesus, John the Baptist, he finds himself in a prison cell just waiting to die. He's in a prison cell, and he starts to question some things. I would imagine he has a lot of time to think. Jesus hasn't completely turned the world upside down yet. He hasn't established his kingdom. He isn't in a governing position. There's no reigning In fact, now that you mention it, things don't seem to be changing that much at all. At least from John's vantage point. And so, as John sits there in his cell, he begins to doubt. So what does he do? He goes to the source. Jesus. Well, he sends his disciples. He's a little bit tied up at the time. John heard what Christ is doing, and it causes him to doubt. And so he sends his disciples to ask the question. They're going to ask Jesus directly. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Are you the guy? Because I thought you were. Now I'm not so sure. But maybe. I think you are. I'm not quite as sure as I once was. I have some questions. I was hoping that you could clear these up for me. Go to God. Make God your starting place. Make him step one instead of the last resort. 
I mean, many times we start with ourselves and we kind of form this worldview around that. We make ourselves the central figure and we say, man, I got some things that I got to work through. Or we go to other people and say, man, I'm working through these things. And and we we like to surround ourselves with people who are just going to affirm what we say or affirm what we were thinking. And instead, John, he starts with Jesus, and he takes the approach of whatever Jesus says here, I'm going to orient my life around that. If he says he's the guy, great. If he says he's not the guy, then i got to find the guy. But I'm going to listen to whatever he says, and I'm going to examine the evidence that he gives me. And so first, we go to God. Next, we examine the evidence, right? Jesus replies to John's disciples. Jesus says to them, he says, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. That's a personal note for John there at the end. Jesus lays it right out for John the Baptist. He lays it right out there. He tells John's guys, he's like, you tell John. You tell him. You tell him the blind are able to see, and the people who couldn't hear before, they can now hear, right? The the lame, they're walking around. The dead, well, they're not so dead anymore. And uh, those who are hopeless and helpless are being encouraged. And John the Baptist, he knows the Old Testament well enough to know that these are things that only the Messiah can do. Only the anointed one of God. These are markers of the Messiah. And so when his doubts are put up against what, what is happening. So you could see these really clearly. He, he knows what's happening with his doubts. When he puts the evidence up next to it, he sees that he doesn't have a leg to stand on. See, doubt is a feeling, and we have to match our feelings right up to the unchanging Word of God. The unchanging Word of God. It's not, the Word of God is never going to contradict itself, right? And so if what I'm feeling goes up uh, against that which I know to be completely true, completely infallible, right? Completely perfect in every way, right? If if what I'm feeling doesn't mesh with that, then I know that that's something that I got to rid myself of. I know that's something I got to rid myself of. And so we go to God and we look at the evidence. We open up the word and we place our doubts up right next to it, right? Right next to scripture. The, The question isn't about whether my doubts fit the world. The, you know, the world is folly. The ways of the world are foolish. The question is whether my doubts fit the word. We match them up with scripture and see if those doubts hold water. See, God's word remains the same. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Everything else changes, but God never does. He is unchanging. His character does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you and I can build our lives on this truth, on this firm foundation. And so when you have doubts, seek evidence from the Lord himself. Get the truth for yourself. Get the truth for yourself. If we don't examine the evidence ourselves, how can we expect to have a faith that will withstand doubt? I mean, I think all too often too many people, they believe because somebody else did or because someone else told them to, and they just kind of go through these motions like a believer, but they're not because they never made that faith, the faith of someone else, their own. And when people do that, they end up following people and not God. So have faith. Do it on purpose. Be intentional. Seek him. Get the truth for yourself. Make your confession and then hold to that confession. Hold tightly to that. I mean, after we go to God and after we examine the evidence, we make a decision to hold our doubts or hold the truth. 
We choose one. We pick one. We make a resolution. And so that's the last thing we need. We proceed with resolve. Be resolved. See, doubt becomes unbelief when it undermines our commitment to God. Doubt becomes unbelief when it undermines our commitment to God. Even the demons believe in God. Even the demons believe in God. The difference is commitment. They are not committed to God. They do not seek Him, nor do they serve Him. Be resolved. Determine. Be determined not to be taken captive by tossing winds and waves of worldly philosophies. Decide not to be taken hostage by deceitful schemes. Resolve not to uh, endlessly cycle through these these currents of of, uh, analysis, paralysis, with no intention of reaching a clear conclusion. Choose what you will do. And tell your heart and mind to get in line. Tell them how things will be. Choose today whom you will serve. See, Jesus reveals, he reveals privately to his disciples in Mark, in Mark 9 here, right? He, he tells them of the certain challenges. These things can only be done through prayer and fasting. There had to be great faith and great preparation through the Lord to overcome it. We need to be in the Word. Be resolved to study it. Be resolved to cling to it. Decide to pray vigilantly. Decide not to neglect uh, connecting with God through prayer. I mean, this is serious business here. Living for the Lord is serious business. We need to take every thought captive. I mean, Paul reminds us that although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. A casual approach is never sufficient. A casual approach is never sufficient. Too often, we are like these disciples. We may have noble ambitions, but When we fail to put in the work necessary, we don't find victory and we don't overcome. Jesus warns throughout Scripture, He warns those who look upon Him with casual admiration. It's not enough. It's not enough to put your hand to the plow and look back. Don't just start something and not finish it. Don't put your hand to the plow and look back. Don't make your faith just a Sunday morning uh, thing. Don't follow Jesus from afar. Don't admire him. He's not to be admired. He is to be loved and served and obeyed. If you confessed Jesus Christ, if you committed your heart and mind to him, then love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. There's nothing casual about it. Choose whom you will follow and then take up your cross and follow him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word that is alive and active. Lord, we thank you that you have made yourself known to us. And God, I pray that today you would do it again. That today you would make yourself known again. For Lord, we know that as, as many times as we call upon you, you answer us. For as many times as we need you, you are there. Lord, you know that we all doubt. And so God, today we confess to you that we struggle.
we not only struggle, God, but we, we struggle to admit those doubts to you. Help us, Lord, to take those doubts to you each and every time. Help us to lean in to you. Lord, we want to be people of conviction. We want to be people. We want to be your people and not divided. Give us allegiances for you and you alone. Help us to cling to your promises. Lord, we know that today there have been many people who would say that they doubt that you are real. They doubt your existence. They doubt your goodness. They doubt your omnipotence. Lord, I pray that they might see the one true God, that they might know the uh, alive, the living Christ. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict, convict our hearts for ways that we have casually subscribed to your word casually followed you when it was convenient Lord we love you We turn to you and we commit ourselves today to trusting in your unfailing love for your love is better than life. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.